Um, I'm going to follow up on ethics and transindividuation, but from a very, very different perspective, uh, in the sense that uh, what I'm going to be talking about is going to be much more practical than uh, philosophical. Uh, in many ways, when I promised to talk about transindividuation and the ethics of software design, it was a big promise that I made. Uh, obviously, or what um, uh, to place it, I'm placing it, this is the beginning of a very collaborative research project that I'm putting together over the next few years with a bunch of people, where it's going to be kind of transdisciplinary collaboration to think about ethics of software design. Obviously, it's not something that I can do by myself. Um, and so what you have at this point is really the very, very, not even beginning of the project, but uh, a, a, an intellectual meandering or, you know, a, a refining of the, some of the conceptual um, toolboxes uh, for me. Uh, so I'm going to be meandering and I'm going to go very different directions uh, in the sense that I'm going to leave software behind at some point. But uh, to start with uh, the question of ethics, my uh, perspective here on ethics is perhaps different because I want to approach it from a therapeutic perspective in the sense that I'm interested in doing a therapy or doing, uh, a doing developing a therapeutical approach to software design. By um, ethics of transindividuation, where you know I situate myself is very much uh, in uh, relational psychoanalysis and psychoanalysis of attachment. Um, those might not be, you know, we always think about psychoanalysis as for Lacan and nothing else, but uh, relational psychoanalysis, that's Winnicott, Balby, and um, so on and so forth. Uh, more recently, somebody who's very important in the field is Jessica Benjamin, uh, because she thinks about ethics and therapeutic uh, approach. And what is in common with all those people is that they really start from the question of recognition, uh, that is the primacy of the other, the question that it is about, you know, the... Um, but uh, if you think about the uh, therapeutic approach, the idea is that um, there is a process of recognition, that recognition is a mutual recognition between therapist and client in the sense that there's a recognition that um, uh, other as such but also in this process of thinking about recognition as a process that is never always that is always you know uh, something that's never quite achieved and that also engage with mutuality what opens up is a space of indeterminacy in the therapeutic setting in the way that uh, people think about it or experience it in practice what that means is that there is a field of potentiality that opens, if you want um, to borrow from, a, from another vocabulary, in the sense that there is a dance of recognition, that uh, what is engaged in in the therapeutic relationship is a therapist recognizing the other and recognizing the power they have in recognition, in granting agency to the other. And at the same time, there is something that comes back or that the uh, client engages in, which is also becomes that dance of mutual recognition. So uh, it's a developmental kind of process. Uh, so why am I talking about the therapeutic setting, which is really face-to-face um, -face and really non-technical uh, usually, is because I want to do the same thing, or I want to try to do this approach and to think about recognition and mutual recognition in our relationship with software in the sense that if software now, and what I mean by software in this particular perspective is social software, which is software that aims to produce the social, that aims to produce recommendation, that does the work of recognition, really. And what I want to do and what I want to think about is that if software does the work of recognition, then we definitely need a therapeutic approach with it. And that perhaps, you know, one of the roles we could do or that, you know, I, you know, would define as a media scholar or a media studies person would be to enter into a therapeutic approach with software. And this is where the question of design comes <coughs> in. So in that sense, then, that kind of makes the transition between mutual recognition, which is face-to-face, human-to-human, to transindividuation, which is what happens when software does the work of recognition, when it takes over, you know, uh, this uh, particular mode of transindividuation. So let's talk a little bit about another, um, to put another um, definition in place, what, is, what do we mean, what do I mean by uh, social software and by extension social media? Um, coming from media studies, usually we're like pretty, you know, uh, worried about meaning and, and questions of meaning. But with social media, what we're looking at is really uh, uh, what Gatari would call a signification, which is it's not so much about what meanings are carried by social media, but what it does to us. 
Um, if you want, you know, and in a sense that I would define social media as a techno-symbolic uh, system to, pro to create social connections. Let's start with that, and that would be a very simple definition to start with. Um, what's happening and uh, where we hit a wall pretty quickly is that our current experience with social media, which are Facebook, Google, and so on, uh, don't really quite fit that definition because, yes, they do are, they are techno-symbolic systems to produce social connections, but that is, you know, a means towards another end. The other end, the actual end and aim of social media is to gather all kinds of data, to create markets, and to create personalized recommendation, and so on and so forth, meaning um, that it creates value out of the psychosocial. Uh, an example of this and an example of what's going on is this kind of like representation of Facebook connections and they're pretty, you know, you see those very kind of representations everywhere now. It's kind of like you have a big map and you map all the people who are connected on social media and then you look at the data they exchange and then you map it onto the world and then yeah, you, have, you have the globalized world and everybody's happy in some ways. It's kind of like that law of equivalencies that somebody was mentioning yesterday where it's kind of like connectivity equals social connection equals richness equals, you know, some kind of dream about the social which fits into a neoliberal approach, pretty much. So this kind of visualization, this kind of production by software, by social software, is pretty much you know, what I want to target in some ways. It is the uh, disease, if you want. Um, what I um, want to add on to that also is that when we think about um, social media and the kind of social software that we have, and that's coming from personal experience, is that it's really it becoming harder, harder and harder to get away from those kinds of representation in the sense that, you know, and the work that I've been doing with colleagues when we entered, you know, kind of, you know, over, over you know, since 2003, really, when we started looking at Web 2.0 and, you know, the transformation and the rise of social media was really to try to, you know, do our digital methods approach, looking at the protocols, opening the protocols, kind of using the protocols to kind of really do a, you know, dissection of social social media and to see how they function. Uh, it is more and more impossible to do such work these days because social media platforms as Facebook and Google and so on are too proprietary, too black boxed. You know, it's, it's pretty much impossible or very, very hard to do that. Also, it can be done, but at a certain price, which means entering into the logic of the social media platform itself, which means entering into a logic of neoliberal, a, a neoliberal logic which means that it's really you know, difficult to get into all kinds of data or that sort of thing without paying a price for it in the first place. It like, costs a lot of money to be able to access the data on social media platform, therefore it becomes impossible for any researchers to do research, really, if it's not about making money. Uh, and then secondly, uh, secondly, you know, I'm only talking about some social media platforms that have that kind of openness of data. I'm not even going to talk about Google, for instance, which is just you know, off limits, really. Um, so therefore, you know, where I'm coming from or on a personal kind of, um, you know, trajectory or uh, uh, methodological trajectory is uh, a real sense of powerlessness in the face of social media platform in the sense that our traditional approach to the methods analyze and so on and so forth, it's not possible to do that anymore. But, and this is where we go into therapeutics. In the sense that let's, let's you know I want to try to think about that approach, that therapeutical approach, which is to look at software and to try to talk with software, but with other kinds of software. So this is another example of a kind of social media or social software. This is from Artis Open Source, and um, it's a project called Versus, and it's I think they're based in Italy. Uh, this is a representation of um, a protest in Rome in 2011. And this is a map, like this is kind of a, a map of all the social media platforms, Twitters and all that, as the protest unraveled. And so you can see this kind of a mapping of intensities as, you know, protests kind of, um, you know, protest to walk around and encounter with the police, clash with the police and so on and so forth. So are these open sources about um, kind of, um, Thinking about this uh, this uh, this type of um, you know kind of uh, social media as much more of an idea of um, mapping of the intensities, which is another way to look at um, social media. It's like the mapping of social intensities, mapping of social connections. <coughs> 
as you can see, and immediately what you can see is um, kind of a limit where there's um, a certain notion of perhaps failure in there is that this is uh, a visualization that aims at recording an event. But what happens to the event once you're, once you're outside of it? So see some kind of visualization that might be meaningful while you're at the event in the protest and you're living through the event or that might create a resonance. But for external you know, viewers like us, the problem is that we encounter social media that attempts to record those intensities, but what it does is that it fails to become an archive or a live archive or a meaningful archive. So why am I talking about this and why am I bringing Artie's Open Source and Versus S? Um, what I'm interested in is to look at uh, failures and one way to start talking about a therapeutic approach is to look at you know, what fails, where are the breakdowns, where are the failures. And I don't mean that in a particularly negative way. It's really important to look at failures or failures of communication because they are the productive and potential space you know, from a therapeutic approach. It's really important to look at failure and to cultivate them in some ways. So what I mean by that is by looking at failures, it's pretty much in the same way as if you want um, that uh, Matthew Fuller said, talks about looking at the behind the blips and behind the errors and all that and looking for what doesn't quite work. Uh, in that sense, we open up possibilities. So here we have already, you know, when we look at visualization like that, which happens to be kind of visualizations that reproduce, that try to reproduce a rhythm of the social, a rhythm of encounters, a rhythm of transindividuation as the protester walk through the street of Rome, encounter the police and clash with the police and so on and so forth. Uh, we already have a limitation in a sense of, as I've said, you know, uh, when the event becomes an archive, what happens and where does meaning takes place? Where does it become meaningful for us? So the next slide. So thinking about failure a little more and thinking about the blips and so on and so forth and the kind of software studies approach that Matthew Fuller um, uh, argues for, uh, this is another example of um, uh, a project, and I would say it's a social media project, is using social software that cultivates purposefully failure. Uh, this is that glass, um, part of his project that's called a facial weaponization suite. Uh, what Blast does is that he gathers a bunch of people uh, in a room, it's kind of uh, an experimental kind of uh, setting, and uh, they uh, take their biometric data, he takes their biometric data. And then out of that, he creates that kind of collective mask, right? Um, so as you can see, it's kind of like this kind of application of, you know, the, the, the perhaps what we could call the worst principle of biometrics and big data, which is take everybody's data, put it together, and then you have some kind of collective. And what emerges out of that is something completely meaningless, of course. Um, and why does Zach Blast does that? Because he gathers certain types of people, which are, you know, uh, homosexuals, for instance. And then through that kind of creation, or like putting together this biometrics data, he gets at the creation of what he calls the fag mask, for instance, which is really uh, challenging that notion of like there is a typical homosexual, uh, for instance. Um, and then what that does uh, is that it really kind of articulates, if you want, the failure of current approaches to um, social media and social software, and it says this is absolutely meaningless. But at the same time, what happens is the mask in the setting of the experiment becomes a, a, a really important transindividual uh, trans uh, actor, if you want in the sense that you know, the production of the mask is only one part of the whole experiment. But what happens after is that people gather and there's much more discussion and exchanges about you know, how do you reflect upon that mask and reflect upon the question of stereotypes, there being stereotyped, biometrics, data, surveillance, and so on and so forth. So it is really a transformative you know, kind of potential that is expressed with the mask. It cultivates failure, it cultivates the failure of big data processes, but at the same time through those failures it opens up new potentials. Right. So I've talked about you know looking at failures and errors and so on and so forth, and I want to talk a little more about something else, which is hauntedness, uh, and that's you know not from software studies, but that's coming from affect theory, in particular the work uh, the work of Lisa Blackman. Uh, and um, where she does, uh, uh, um, she argues that we should look at data uh, as haunted data, and we should really, uh, and she's uh, using more of a Derridean approach there. But what she's looking at is saying, you know, we should look at the resonances, what is left behind, what the traces are left behind uh, with data. 
Uh, something that's really hard to do in the current paradigm of big data because data seems to be so simple and straightforward each time it's presented to us through visualization. So how does that, how, we can, how can we think about haunted data? Uh, here I would like to talk a little bit about Lev Manovich and this is the kind of uh, his newest project, the uh, exceptional and the everyday 144 hours in Kiev, which well, took place uh, during the uh, political events, um, uh, the recent political events in Kiev. He, this is a gathering, like what he did, you know, and, uh, and Lev Manovich has been doing those kind of massive projects of gathering images, you know, and scraping images and using data analytics to kind of do those giant visualization. And um, so this is Kiev, this is taken from Flickr. Um, uh, so it's kind of like a series of pictures that were uploaded on Flickr from people in Kiev uh, around the square. Um, what is interesting with uh, Manovich is uh, that whereas he started doing those kind of visualization uh, back in the days where he was trying to do a big visualization of mangas, you know, like he, the, he had software to scan pages and pages of mangas to try to look if there's a style of mangas and all that, and you can see the visualization is still online. They're massive. They're pretty meaningless in the sense that even he would say like, I don't know what that means, you know, like, like he couldn't find a style in the sense that like he couldn't use the software to do an interpretation to kind of find a meaning, to kind of find the kind of like aesthetics, uh, if you want. Uh, and so since then he's changed quite a bit in the sense that he says, even though he still was an artist, but now he says, you know, well, I think of myself as an artist who is painting with data. Uh, and that's interesting to see the idea of being painting with data because that leads us also to another perspective on social media, which is to say, well, let's um, get away from the digital in the sense that let's think about social media in continuity. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that in the last um, part of my presentation. But what is interesting to do then as a kind of exercise is to say, well, you know, you think of yourself, you know, as, you know, a software designer, as somebody who paints with data. Well, what is a painter to do with data? What is another type of painter to do with data? And I just want to make a comparison with uh, Gerhard Richter's uh, atlas there, um, which is, you know, the kind of, uh, his atlas is a kind of massive document and it's really a collection of all the data in some ways and all the pictures and all that that he's accumulated since the 1960s and he's been organizing ever since. What I find is interesting there is in some ways, you know, what uh, Manovich tries to get at, Richter perhaps gets to in the sense that he finds intensities, right? Of course, the comparison is really biased in some ways because Manovich deals with external data um, and Richter deals with very curated data, his own personal pictures of things that he gathers and collects. But what is interesting is the organization there and thinking about the organization and the organization of what is it that, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, surfaces through the um, kind of putting together of all those images that are kind of have that similarities. <coughs> I want to just make a, a, a sense here that uh, how I would think about it is that really what Richter provides us with is a sense of idiorhythmics and that's taken from Roland Barthes. Uh, and idiorhythmics is the sense, and I'm, I put this picture of the sea um, as an exemplar of this because Bart talks about idiorhythmics, so he says, but rhythm is like we shouldn't think it, about it as a beat or a cadence, but really we should think about, you know, the rhythm of the waves, uh, the rhythm of the water, which has no regularity when you look at it, but at the same time has this kind of, is a rhythm, is a natural kind of uh, emanation. Idiorhythmics, and I'm talking about it with Bard because it links back to the therapeutic situation of um, also it is somebody that's constructed or shared, it's about living together. And Bard gives the example of um, idiorhythmics or the failure of idiorhythmics when he sees a mother dragging his child along the, along the street and uh, talking about how that's a failure of rhythm, the child kind of has to you know, be dragged along. Whereas, you know, when you think, he says, think about moments where there would be a, um, a kind of like uh, idiorhythmics between two people that they could walk along together or, you know, adult and child and so on and so forth. This brings us back to that, but in the question of like, well, where is the idiorhythmics between us viewers and, you know, the kind of data itself, right? Uh, how does, you know, Gerard Richter, for instance, provide us with an idiorhythmics or invites us into a rhythm with him? 
So by comparison, and this is just to kind of do a, uh, do a kind of a more genealogy if you want, this is again Manovich mapping uh, where the Flickr pictures that he gathered were taken from. And this is another view of uh, another pages from Gerard Richter's atlas, the cities, uh, about cities. And again, this notion of intensity and perhaps, you know, through this comparison, we understand more what Manovich is trying to get at. Uh, and um, uh, Manovich or the trying to get at some intensities. I'm just going to talk about it like that um, because what we're getting into with Richter is the idea of the personal archive and the personal you know, archive um, is actually something that um, Yukri has written about in, uh, in an upcoming uh, chapter in a book that I've uh, co-edited called uh, Compromised Data. It's forthcoming soon. So he has much more to say and much more brilliant things to say about archive and archive as a technique of care. Okay, so that was the product placement part of the talk. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm going to depart there because what is interesting then is to think about, you know, social media. Uh, we think about Facebook, Google, and so on and so forth when we say the word social media, but let's go back to the original definition that I offered at the beginning, which is a techno-symbolic system to create connections. And if we think about that, then, you know, and if we just get rid of the digital question for a moment, we can think about how there has been other forms of social media. And actually, social media has been around for a long time. And I find, you know, and, you know, there's obvious, you know, questions about getting rid of the digital for now, but this is a simply an exercise in media archaeology, which is to find a continuity. What is interesting through that process is, like, because the current forms of social media, the Facebook and so on, are so impoverished and so this in, uh, already about the indiv disindividuation rather than transindividuation, it's kind of nice to try to go back to other forms of social media that are aware about transindividuation. And so um, in discussions with my students, we're talking about that, you know, what are kind of, you know, forms of social media that techno-symbolic system to create social connections. One of my students was like, well, probably fire was one of the early one, and I would tend to agree with him, fire connects. Um, uh, but, you know, fire doesn't leave many traces, that's the problem. <laughs> so I'm going to go to textile, actually. And I'm going to say and argue for textile as a point of comparison because it was one of the earliest and most durable um, social media and media of transindividuation. So what do I mean by that? Um, let me start with that, with um, something uh, that's called, uh, it's, uh, it's an example from the Nui project in Japan, which is an example of current transindividuation. Nui means uh, stitch in Japan, so it's a stitching project. It's uh, organized or it takes place uh, it's at an institution, a, 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 a psychiatric institution in, um, near Fukuoka, I think. Uh, where, you know, uh, it's a private institution where people with um, severe disabilities are, um, can stay and they stay for life, usually. They become resident and become resident for life. And there's a lot of art therapy organized there. And Nui is one of their most famous projects because they work with people with um, uh, severe autism and so on to uh, do the stitching project. And, um, and those are, you know, people who cannot communicate with the world, as in, you know, that's that's their main mode of communication is through the stitching or through the arts, artistic projects. What is interesting about Nui is that you get those uh, intensities, you know, and you get to a communication with that language, uh, a communication um, that is as signifying that is about the communication of intensities. I'm repeating myself. But what's interesting about Nui too is that it is an encounter, right? And it uses textile as a medium of encounter because Left to their own device, uh, the people who are doing the stitching, uh, the, 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 the residents, would never finish. Like, they would probably end up with a big ball of yarn and just continue because they don't have, you know, the idea of stopping, right? So, um, so it is a work of, you know, kind of, uh, um, you know, kind of recognition that takes place here between the artists and therapeutists involved in the projects to kind of get them to stop at some point when, you know, there is, like, it, it is a negotiation. And um, so you have here a mapping of intensities that takes place, um, which is interesting because it also opens up and it goes back to that therapeutic sense of opening the space of potential. What goes here and was through the new project appears is a really important um, uh, uh, sense of um, uh, going back to uh, non-language, or in the sense of, I would even kind of describe it as an anasemic enterprise. And so it's coming from anasemia, which is the idea of going back to the origin of meaning, which is non-meaning. And so in the new project, you have this kind of example of anasemic enterprise. Uh, 
important to think about transindividuation then because it is really going back to like this kind of encounter that creates the possibility of communication itself and then exchange and connection. And I'm going to end up with another example and talking about textile as a social media and as a fruitful form of um, uh, um, uh, thinking about what could be social media. This is another example from Japan. It's called Boro, which means rags. Um, this is um, actually the kind of uh, the rags and the stitching um, in Japan at some point was really important because textile was so rare. And so there was this notion of like how to deal with textile, how uh, darning textile was really important. So garments have to be completely continuously repaired, especially for workers, of, co of course. And um, there would be, you know, kind of uh, pieces of garments and pieces of cloth would be stitched together to patch and so on and so forth. What is interesting with this kind of very, you know, uh, mundane, if you want, uh, uh, practice is that it became an ecosophy in Japan. And that's why it's become very famous, because Boro, um, the rags, is really uh, an encounter between and a way in which to use a kind of media to think about uh, a relationship with the environment, a, social rela social, a set of social relationships and a psycho, um, psycho uh, subjective or uh, individual relationship. What I mean by that is, you know, the environment is obviously dealing with the rarity of cloth and the kind of dealing with cloth at the time was, you know, made by hand and also dyed in indigo, which was a natural resources. And that was a way to really relate to the environment. Uh, the social relationship, because it was very gender-based relationship around cloth and cloth dyeing in Japan and the repair of that, but there were also a sense of agency and dignity that came with it. The practice of mending became a, a dignified practice, became a practice of agency. And at the same time, that leads into a kind of more um, um, psycho-individual kind of uh, liberation, if you want, or uh, assertiveness, or uh, kind of uh, an encounter, or a practice of ethics of care, if you want. And if you want, you know, when you look at Boro in Japan, you kind of like I get a sense of that kind of ethics of care that takes place. Um, all of this to say that obviously this is really far away from social media, but at the same time it's really interesting to put it in perspective because it really talks about what is missing from current discussion about social media and perhaps what is missing when we talk about social software. We tend to be usually a prisoner of like thinking about social software or how to use it and we think about connection and making visualization on the one hand or using for geolocative purposes mobile technologies and so on on the other. Let's think about software in more, you know, perhaps in uh, we think it, we casting it in more material senses about what it could do. We could use software for um, different purposes on different medium and formats. Uh, software can be used to weave clothes. Software can be used to do 3D printing. There's kind of all those kind of applications that can be opened up that way by thinking about other forms of social media as having a long history. So to conclude, by any means, I am not advocating for a return of home economics. Uh, no, uh, this is horrible. I've been, you know, raised uh, by a proper French family. I had to do the sewing and embroidery when I was a little girl, and ugh, I wouldn't want to do that kind of impose that kind of gender disciplining on anybody for sure. But what I want to open up is uh, uh, some kind of discussion in the sense of what does it mean to go back to crafting which is also what's behind the idea of textile. And let me finish in some ways by textile as being, you know, a final point of comparison because it started as a practice of transindividuation. And I'm not going to go through the whole history of textile, which is incredibly rich when you look at it, pre-industrialization. And then, so it was a practice in the social media of transindividuation that got totally wiped out by industrialization, right? Uh, to the extent that we don't recognize it and that kind of, those kinds of uh, um, uh, practices of relationship do not exist anymore. At the same time, uh, we can think about our current social media as probably already industrialized and having never been, you know, kind of getting to that point of uh, being, you know, something that we craft together, something that is a practice of ecosophy, of being together in the world. And I'm going to end up here. Thank you for listening to my meandering. Thank you.